Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here for our live webinar about AI, AI revolution in business immigration, navigate threats, and unlock opportunities. We already have 74 people connected. We have almost 300 people registered, so we're expecting around half of that to be here. Uh, of course, as you, as some of you may already know, um, we will be sending the recording as soon uh, as we finalize the live webinar, and you will all be uh, receiving that recording by email. Okay. So today uh, we're going to get started right away. So for those who, who will arrive late, maybe you can uh, see the recording for the initial part. So let's get started. So hi again, everyone, and welcome to our latest webinar about AI. AI revolution in business immigration, navigating threats and unlocking opportunities. The title is a little bit long, but there's a lot to explore about this topic. So let's get started. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Marianella. For those who don't know me, I'm the Global Director of Sales and Marketing at Journey Business Plan, and I'll be your host for today. Seeing the, the number of people registering and attending to our webinars keeps on being very flattering, so thank you, thank you so much to all of you. As always, let me quickly, quickly give you an overview of what Journey does. At Journey, we specialize writing business plans for immigration purposes. With a team of over 180 experts, we prepare more than 6,000 business plans each year across 160 different industries. In today's webinar, we're going to explore the ongoing AI revolution in business immigration. AI, as, you, as many of you already know, has a huge impact, influencing the daily tasks of immigration professionals as well as government processes. Because of the two different perspectives, we couldn't settle for just one expert. So we decided to bring in two for a panel. First, I would like to introduce Zainab Zaye. Zainab also participated in our previous webinar on the recent SUV program updates two weeks ago. Zainab has been assisting businesses and individuals with their immigration needs for over a decade now. She's a leader in bringing the latest developments in AI used in immigration processing. Zainab's background and expertise make her the go-to person for an insightful discussion on AI from a government perspective. Our second guest is Josh, let me, let me try this, Josh Shkakno. <laughs> Josh is a Toronto-based immigration lawyer. After spending more than two years growing his own law firm and helping hundreds of immigrants and companies navigate Canadian immigration, he realized that there was no technology to help make the process easy. So he started Visto, a platform that helps immigration firms work more efficiently by automating all of the things that he spends years doing manually. So who better to explain AI from a law firm perspective? Welcome, Zainab and Josh, and thank you for taking the time to join us today. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Marianella. Really appreciate the opportunity. Yes, thank you both for being here. I'm, I'm, I mean, we're so lucky to have you. It couldn't be better than you both on this panel. <laughs> uh, so for everybody to know, we'll start this uh, webinar by covering the fundamentals of AI, followed by a discussion of AI from the perspectives of law firms and also uh, consulting firms and uh, the government. We will then explore real life cases and demos and we'll delve into the potential risks of AI and conclude with a Q&A session. So on the right hand side, uh, you have an option to add questions. So feel free to do that. And there's also a chat. Uh, I would love to know where people are located. Where are you joining us from? Everybody's very welcome. And, and again, like I said, uh, very, very happy that all, are, all of you are here. Um, so, as you can see, there's a lot to cover, so let's dive right in, shall we? Let's get started with the basics, okay? Let's start with Zainab. Um, Zainab, let me share your presentation so that you can have what Thank you need. Thank you. We're here. Perfect. Um, so, I think it would be 
very helpful to start this conversation, which is an extremely broad topic with some definitions in terms of what we mean when we talk about AI. Um, and it's ironic because I'm actually going to say there's no defined or clear definition that's fully agreed upon in terms of what artificial intelligence actually is. We have several different working definitions and it's mostly, uh, I, my go-to one is one of the definitions that uh, IRCC Immigration Refugee Citizenship Canada uses is this idea of using information technology to perform tasks that would ordinarily require us to think, essentially to use uh, brain power to accomplish. Um, so it can be making sense of spoken language, learning behaviors, solving problems, finding patterns, making predictions, and so on. And um, I think I can go to the next slide. Oh, yes, I can. Perfect. Uh, some of the other key terms that you're going to hear us use today are, and they're completely related to this conversation, is, you know, using um, AI for automation. Um, there's automated decision-making support systems. So that's a little bit of what I will be talking about in terms of decision-making by IRCC. Um, you know, it's uh, using AI for advanced analytics and predictive analytics that can be used on the part of government but it also can be used by um, practitioners for various purposes. The, there's the idea of machine learning. And I think we're going to spend a lot of time talking about one of the, the very uh, exciting ones, which is generative AI, the um, possibilities that large language models present. So these are some of the, the terms that you will hear. And Typically, what we're um, we'll, we'll use different terms as we go through, but uh, I think that's probably a good point for us to jump into this conversation. Wonderful, Zainab. Thank you so much, um, Josh. Let's hear it from the law firm standpoint. Um, how can AI's transformative potential streamline processes and enhance efficiency? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big question, Marianella, because I, I think so far we've seen a lot of advancements and excitement just from like, we'll call it phase one of AI. But I think what a lot of people don't understand is that like how it's really just warming up, right? So first of all, to actually answer the question, um, I work with dozens of immigration law firms and, and talk to many more every week, right? Just through the nature of, of my company. And right now, what we're seeing is it, it's a lot of, of like the back end operations, right? So um, basic communications, standardizing documents, drafting documents, a little bit of communication back and forth. I think we'll see improvements in that area in the future. But right now, I think the biggest potential is in kind of the automation and preparation of back end operations that most immigration firms have been paying staff to do, right? So for example, um, drafting basic templates, drafting blog posts, right? Which we'll, we'll get into more down the road when we talk about marketing, um, you know, creating strategies, you know, that kind of stuff, um, as well as automation, filling in forms and, you know, Doing, doing the basics that like mostly assistants and staff and, and clerks and that kind of stuff is doing. Part of the reason why I'm so excited and like, and you know, bullish on AI is because it's just getting started and I can kind of start to see the hints of, okay, if we give this another one, two, five years, it's gonna slowly start being able to do a lot of what us immigration professionals are even doing. Right. So right now, I think we're at the very base level. It's starting to replace a lot of these simple tasks, the copy paste, the, you know, the admin type work. But if we give it another couple of years, um, it's going to start doing not to scare anybody, because I think we'll all have jobs for quite some time. And maybe we're going to talk about that, too. But it's going to start being able to do valuable legal interpretation and suggestion and work that will allow the professionals to spend time on what I would argue would be even, you know, higher quality type of stuff for your law firm, right? Right now, a lot of immigration firms spend most of their time, energy, and resources on back-end operations, right? AKA like fulfillment, right? You sell a work permit visa for $3,000. Now you got to fulfill it, 
right? Mm -hmm. The more we can automate that back end, the more you can focus on the value creation of getting more clients, sales, marketing, networking, and growing your top line. So anyways, I'll, I'll put a pin on that there. As you can see, I'm kind of getting fired up here. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. But uh, that, that would be my answer to, to, the, to that question. Great, Josh. Thank you so much for that. Um, I wanted to ask something, and, and Sainav can also jump in. Um, everybody's talking about AI for, for a few months, maybe a year, probably more. Uh, what's triggering all the hype right now about AI if I believe we were already using it in some cases before? Zainab, you want to go first? Sure. Um, I think, you know, <laughs> chat GPT just captured everyone's imagination. So there were, you know, for, for, for folks like Josh and I who've been following these developments and working in this field, um, that it, we were aware of these things and particularly, I think, on the automation side of things. But the uh, seeing the way in which, um, you know, chat GPT is able to create uh, what seems like very um, uh, well put together responses uh, and then all the tools that are being, you know, that are essentially sort of wraparounds for chat GPT that are being produced, whether it's, you know, writing different um, types of documents or generating, you know, uh, marketing materials and whatnot. It has really captured people's imagination. I think we were probably as a, as an overall population, not thinking that, things had advanced as quickly as they had. Um, and I think that's a huge part of what's fueling the, the big conversations we're having these days. Yes, I, I, I do agree. And I am actually a user of ChatGPT. Uh, but as, as we were also discussing a few days ago with Sainav and Josh, uh, ChatGPT created the hype, but ChatGPT is only a very small part of the full AI revolution, right? And, and we're going to see that a little bit ahead. Well, part of that too, like Marianella, to kind of summarize that is ChatGPT was what I would consider the catalyst, right? Mm -hmm. So what did, what did we see happen within weeks or months of ChatGPT? Well, now Microsoft invests $10 billion in it, right? Google's BARD gets pushed up to the top of the list, right? We probably got thousands of startups, right, that, that were formed off, off the backs of it. Right. So really what it did, as Zainab said, is it opened up everybody's eyes to what's possible, but it was the catalyst to this whole revolution. And I think the big difference between like if I could make a comparison to like crypto is like people are still trying to figure out what the heck to do with crypto. Right. We're not going to go down that rabbit hole, but like you can spend two minutes on chat GPT and be like, OK, there's a lot of value already. Exactly. And then the, the next question is imagine three years from now when this gets even better, right? Exactly. That's what I think is the coolest part. Of course, there's risks. We're going to talk about that. But yeah, that, that's why I think the hype is very real and very much deserved, in my opinion, in, in, in this area as compared to maybe some others over the last few years. Definitely, Josh. I, I do agree with that. It's going to be faster and, and more exponential than anybody thinks. So the idea is to be, be ready uh, and also try to be up to date to like regarding what you can use, what you can understand that everybody else is using and be up to date with, with those practices. Um, so that being said, let's jump into AI's impact on legal practices, Josh. Um, so, so let's talk about what's shaping specifically uh, the future of the legal industry with AI. Yeah, I think as someone who's worked in immigration tech specifically over the last five years, I've never seen somebody, I've never seen something catch so many legal professionals' attention before, right? One example is just the people who will book calls with me, they want to check out Visto simply because I know, like, what, like the words out of their mouth, I know AI is the future and I want to get ahead of it and, and, and implement it for my practice. Right. So and I think probably the most important part of that is up until now, you know, there haven't been like many huge leaps in technology that could kind of do our work. You know what I mean? Like if you have a very rudimentary chatbot, 
immigration professionals won't necessarily trust something like that in front of our clients, right? If you have very rudimentary template building, like, okay, maybe it saves you a few minutes copy and pasting, but like, it's, it, it's not going to change. It's not going to change your law firm overnight, right? <laughs> what we're seeing with AI is that the technological improvements could actually be a total game changer for the way you build your practice and the way you handle clients and the way you prep their applications, right? And so much of it can basically be effectively outsourced to technology. And that's why it's such a big part of the conversation right now, right? Maybe the tech isn't fully there today, but you can see where it's at. You can start implementing it in basic functions today, which we're going to talk about. And you could also see the straight line. And I, I talk about this with clients all the time of like, oh, I, I love how you do that right now. But like, can we also do this? And we're like, yeah, yeah, we'll get there, but you got to give us a little bit of time, right? The engineers have to sleep sometimes. So, uh, so anyways, that, that's kind of my, that's my thoughts there. And we're just also getting started, which is, you know, part of the excitement as someone who, who gets to design and build product uh, a lot of the time. Great, Josh. Um, so, so let's talk about like, the overview of what immigration lawyers and immigration consultants are using it for. Um, we can mention maybe uh, document analysis, legal research, uh, contract review, summary. You mentioned marketing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I would say immigration specifically. It kind of depends on the type of practice. If we're talking about economic immigration, right, work permits, study permits, et cetera, the interesting part, in, in my opinion, on economic immigration, and, and this holds true to what we're building at Visto, is a lot of it can actually be done with just automation, not necessarily with AI yet. Um, so, for example, if you're prepping a work permit application, it's LMIA backed, this is just an example, you don't need too much AI yet. Right. So what do we use AI for? Things like drafting submission letters, maybe reference letters, maybe improving resumes, stuff like that. Right. I would say if you go on to the litigation side of things is actually where it can get even more interesting because you're doing case law research. Right. You're drafting submissions. You're, you know, getting into kind of negotiations or conversations back and forth with other parties. Right. Um, some people are just using ChatGPT to write emails, right? Mm -hmm. You might get a complex yeah. question or whatever from a client or a prospective client or the other party that you're negotiating with. I mean, this can go for economic or not. Mm -hmm. And you're like, you know what? It's a busy day. I want to cover these three points. Hey, ChatGPT, write me the email, right? And, I'll, and I'm going to show some examples of this in, in just mm -hmm. a few seconds. But like those little things can shave five, 10, 20 minutes off your day multiple times a day. And that can be a game changer if you still want to run a practice that makes X amount top line, but you don't want to have to work more hours, right? Or you want to increase your margin at the end of the day, right? Like what a, a lot of practitioners may not fully appreciate is that the more you outsource on the operation side, you can have the same amount of top line revenue and have half the amount of expenses on the back end operations, whether that be, you know, staff or you just want to keep growing your firm and not have to hire as quickly. Right. So huge effects on like income statements and, and balance sheets. If we, if we want to get all financial, the other big part is marketing. I think this is slowly starting to be used, but honestly, the most underrated use in my opinion of AI for immigration practitioners is in marketing. Yes, it will be game changing for your operations, but we all know how important and valuable building a personal brand is, building a corporate brand is, posting on social media. If you are trying to grow and build trust and, and gain attention, what better to use AI for than to create, you know, snippets of videos or create scripts that you can use to record a TikTok or to write your LinkedIn post for you, right? Or to write three weeks worth of LinkedIn posts for you, right? And, and the good thing about this, and I'll finish on this note, is part of why 
technology and AI hasn't been fully embraced yet is because we all work in law. And in law, we can't afford to make mistakes. So we have to make sure that the tech is good enough that we can trust it. Social media is a different ballgame. Obviously, you want to post good content. You don't want to post incorrect information. But that's much easier to regulate, right? Hey, ChatGPT, write me a post about the three most common mistakes that people make on study permits. Keep it to four paragraphs. And then you just review it. And in one minute, you can have a post, right? So if you're not posting every day on social media and you're trying to grow a practice, I think you're doing it wrong, personally. Um, that's a sweeping statement, right? Everyone has different situations. But I think if you're not posting every day, you're probably not using AI effectively yet, which is okay. We all start somewhere. And you're missing out for your business. Thank you, Josh, for, for, for that advice. Um, and, and it's interesting because everybody's talking about the risks, the ethical connotations, and we're, we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later on. Uh, but it's interesting because if you are uh, an immigration lawyer, an immigration consultant, AI doesn't necessarily need to replace your most essential activities. It can replace the ones that take a lot of time so that you can focus on those. And of course, accountability, reviewing what is generated is always important as well. So, so definitely in line with what you're saying, Josh. Um, I'd like to hand it off to Zainab so that we can talk a little bit more about understanding and interacting with AI tools used by the government. And then I'll be back with you, Josh, to see some, some demos of what you're mentioning. Thank you. Um, those are fantastic examples that Josh was talking about in terms of how we can essentially arm ourselves to do the best work that we can for our clients and to have a chance to sort of be able to deal with the, the curveballs that IRCC is throwing at us. So um, if I can- you, you want me to share? Yeah, okay, there great. we go. Okay, so I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes talking about some of the tools that um, are already being used by the government. Um, and then, you know, we can talk a little bit about the impact they have and hopefully have a chance to also think about how we can develop our own practices and help our clients deal with these technological tools that are being adopted by the government. Um, and I have to, to start by saying the information we have is probably only a small snapshot of uh, you know the landscape within um, immigration, but also the Treasury Board and the federal government more broadly in terms of how they um, um, are already thinking about using it or working on other projects that um, haven't been deployed or working on projects that are um, being used, but we just don't know about them yet because they either haven't been disclosed or we haven't been able to discover them. Um, some of the ways in which um, advanced analytics, which is again, another part of uh, artificial intelligence is already being used is in terms of triaging applications. I've listed here um, several of the programs that we know where this is already happening. So triaging is where we are required to submit, submit applications. Now, almost every application goes in an electronic format, so it's all data. And that data uh, can go through an initial assessment by IRCC. They've developed, um, you know, algorithms essentially that will determine um, how files will be triaged. So this is definitely happening for temporary resident visa applications, for visitor record applications. Um, and it's also happening for some permanent residence applications like spousal sponsorships. So those initial triaging decisions impact applications because they essentially say, this is a low risk file, it's going in a green bin, or it's going in the fast lane, and this is a potentially a higher risk application, it's going into a different pile, and it's gonna be looked at a lot more closely when the application's actually opened. Um, and then more specifically, some of the tools that have been developed to help with decision-making, um, I think, these are very interesting. We've learned a lot about some of them, um, 
but there's still, again, a lot of questions. So we have, I think Chinook is probably by now one of the most well-known tools that the government is using. Um, it isn't necessarily an artificial intelligence tool by itself, because I think if we think about artificial intelligence, we think, you know, a system that would completely make a decision. Um, Chinook is bringing together a lot of data in a way to um, facilitate really fast decision making. And some of the data that it's bringing in is from another uh, AI tool, which is actually, it's now called ITAD. It was formerly called Watchtower or Lighthouse. And that is a tool that was developed based on about a million uh, prior applications. Um, these are study permit applications. So this is where machine learning comes in. They've taken the application data they had, they've run it through, the, you know, um, these uh, uh, tools and come up with uh, rules and predictive analytics. So every single temporary resident application that's now submitted, visitor, work permit, study permit, doesn't matter, it first runs through ITAT. And if it is essentially matching a pattern that they've uh, identified in terms of fraud, the application is going to be flagged. That information is then put into Chinook. Um, so that's why I'm saying, you know, there, there, there's different ways of talking about these tools in terms of whether they are in fact AI tools right now or whether they are using AI features in them. But, um, you know, the, one of the big concerns about Chinook specifically is that it's taking this sort of data that's predictive analytics. There might be all kinds of concerns that we have in terms of whether that, you know, triggering is first of all, even correct. Um, there might be incorrect data in there. There might be biased data because remember this is based on historical decisions that were made. Um, so those patterns um, that they're detecting for are problematic. And then the other part of, um, for example, Chinook is um, a, a note generator tool. And um, it's interesting because we found out about Chinook back in 2021. So this is pre chat GPT. And when I first learned about the note generator tool that that's used by the government, um, I thought it was essentially copy and paste. So what happens is that an officer can really quickly review an application in an Excel sheet, that's the Chinook tool. And within a minute or two, they'll make a decision to accept or refuse a file. Now, as immigration practitioners, we know anytime there's a refusal, there has to be officer's notes to back up those um, decisions. And previously they were short and sweet and they usually pointed to something that was within the, you know, application that was missing or was not um, correct, et cetera. We started seeing that those notes became very complete and they looked extremely similar. For the most part, they were reading exactly the same. And uh, initially I thought it was a lot of automation and, you know, copy and pasting, you know, maybe they have a list that they're copying from and they're doing it uh, in that way. But once we learned about the note generator and then chat GPT came out, I'm like, you know, mind blown. This is exactly an application of uh, you can give prompts to this tool and it can generate what looks like very reasonable reasons for a refusal. And I think, uh, you know, just as Josh was saying, these things are going to advance and become more and more sophisticated. The note generator or, or similar tools that are going to be used by the government for um, supplementing, you know, the, the, the small amount of human interaction that, that they have in terms of decision making are going to get um, more sophisticated uh, and it will be very difficult to tell what whether a human being actually did something or it was a tech tool and that's actually a really interesting point because um i forgot to include this on the slides marinella but um mm -hmm. i posted about it on my linkedin uh last week when it came out the government came out with this is the federal government uh, at the higher level at the treasury board with guidelines in terms of the government's use of generative ai and one of the big recommendations they had for their own departments that are going to be using 
these tools is you have to make it clear when people are interacting with um, essentially AI tools or generative exactly. AI chatbots or in any way the decisions and interactions that are not coming from a human, essentially coming from software, algorithms, robots, right? We're not there yet. Um, I think probably a lot of the uh, listeners here today will have, you know, heard about the unfortunate way in which we discovered these as opposed to having um, disclosure up front. And I really hope that that's something that the government's going to work on going forward so that we actually know what, what systems we're interacting with. Um, and things on the government side are also moving super, super fast. So, you know, we know there's, there's you know, the third version of Chinook that's currently being used, but we also know the uh, replacement tool, which is called Cumulus is in development. It's going to be a cloud-based version of, um, of Chinook that's going to come. And it's, these are used to try to um, allow for faster processing of applications it's unlikely, even with the current talk that we have, that overall application volumes are going to go down. So just as Josh was talking about, you know, we want to keep our bottom lines and reduce the work, the government is also trying to keep up volumes of applications it's processing with the minimum staff that it has by leveraging this technology. Um, some of the other technologies that I'll just just point to, uh, it's not just IRCC that's use, using these. Um, so CBSA, um, it isn't officially announced, but we do know so, through some case law that they have used facial recognition, um, and that's based on AI. Um, they also have a project, for example, called Project Quantum, which runs a pre-departure assess a risk assessment for um, um, travelers to Canada. And um, there was a report that came out earlier in the year that said, and the prior year, so 2022, it prevented at least 6,000 people from boarding flights. And it's, again, there's a lot of data analytics that's taking place on the back end to be able to make those decisions. Um, these tools are being used and the impact of them on our clients oftentimes is there are a lot of errors that the the tools mm -hmm. are making i mean i can probably maybe get into that a little bit later when we talk about um how to deal with or interact with these ai systems so mm -hmm. I'll, I'll 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 leave it at that for now okay thank you zainab um so so it's it's very tricky right because you talk about tools that that raise red flags and then humans interact and say, okay, this has a trend, let me look at it uh, like in a human form. And then you talk about uh, algorithms really making the decision and then having humans make sure that they're responsible and accountable for whatever they hit uh, send with, right? So, so it's a balance between efficiency and also the risk that, that, that is happening within immigration. Um, and but, I have a question. Go ahead, Sina. But but I do want to add. I mean, there's been a lot of research that's done on this. I'm a, I I work a lot in this space, and we're trying to also um, litigate it in federal court. So th there, we have something called automation bias. Um, so that's why these these systems are very complex in the way that they're used. And you know, we probably have to think about them in our own private practice of this further down the line. But if a visa officer is presented with, you know. Um, information that sort of indicates an applicant is high has a high risk of non-compliance they're much more likely to follow the machine sort of essentially recommendation mm -hmm. or the triaging recommendation as opposed to making their own judgment you know using their own judgment and that, that that's not within the immigration context specific at all like automation bias is something that has been studied um uh, for the past 20 years they've studied it you know in in uh, pilots medical, uh, yeah. in medical exactly in lots yeah. of different contexts so um that's the goal that there is a human that's going to catch this but uh a lo the the challenge right now is given the time pressures is that really happening I'm not exactly. sure. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it can go both ways, right? Because we see the risks, but there's also so much learning and so much capacity that is given now to the officer to make that final decision that it's also very positive that they have that information. And, and like you were saying, parallel maybe to medical. 
Um, mm -hmm. If a doctor receives an x-ray and he receives a report and then he gets all this historic analysis yeah. of what has happened uh, with other cases, it's mm -hmm. way different than him just seeing uh, the context of one application, yes. right? So yeah. definitely it can go both ways. Absolutely. So, so we'll see what, what happens. And, and I wanted to ask, Zainab, um, how would you recommend uh, immigration practitioners to prepare for this or to be on the lookout if they, mm -hmm. if they consider that perhaps they, they, there has been some bias or, or something of the sort? Sure. Um, so I think I can probably just go into this a little bit here. Uh, as things develop and they develop very quickly, I think what is going to be really important for us as practitioners is to understand how the system works and be able to identify if these tools are being used. Now, I know that's very difficult to um, do on an individual basis. Uh, it probably helps to follow conversations such as this, follow some uh, of the, you know, uh, practitioners that are really active in this field to try and get that information um, uh, into sort of uh, and be up to date on it and not just for yourself but also to ex to sort of educate clients and set their expectations so you know our conversations with clients now compared to four years ago is very different because there's a very important component of how we put applications together um, but we also know that because of the way the system works, complete applications can still be refused. So setting client expectations, I think, um, is very important by being able to explain some of this information to them. Um, and then, you know, my, my next point is optimizing your applications. I think there's a couple of ways to do that. Um, you know, uh, probably Josh might have some thoughts about this too, but may, you know, some applications that we previously you know, study permits, visitor visas from five years ago were much more simple applications. Now, um, because the government tool is able to look at so much more in detail, um, we have to make sure that our applications are also more complete, right? And a huge part of that is the data that's going in. We know for a fact that every single um, field that's completed on the forms is going to get populated into a tool, right? Mm -hmm. In the near future, they're going to have OCR, which is optical character recognition, and they'll be able to read every single word in an application. I don't think they're there yet. Um, but, you know, preparing for that is making sure all the documents, all the information match up, and then keeping data. So for subsequent applications, whether there's, uh, you know, an applicant's had a first application that was refused or, you know, first application that was accepted and they're going to do something else in the future, an extension or a new PR application, having your prior data is going to be key. The, um, I think one of the, I would argue actually positive points, Karen, kind of going back to Marinella's point of the government having these tools is they can try to cut down on fraud. Right. So they're able to more quickly match data and information for prior applications. Unfortunately, the way that works is that if you make a mistake, that can also fall into misrepresentation. So it, it creates this higher burden, making sure you keep complete copies of all prior applications and reviewing every single, as I said, field like the forms that we have for immigration are not particularly long. So every single item that you're filling in there is going to be very important and it's going to be um, important to uh, essentially optimize, get as much information in that five word, um, you know, response that you can put in there. Um, and the, the some of the solutions that we have, you know, uh, we haven't really talked about technological issues that we have with IRCC in terms of just interacting with their new portals and things like that. But that, that, that is another big problem that um, they're creating systems, but there's not enough fail safes for when things go wrong. So if an application submitted and then they request documents and we submit the documents, but they don't get attached, how do we deal with things like that? Um, there is now a page on IRCC when you can report technical issues. You should absolutely use that. But um, even when we do, because of the, the, the sheer volume of applications, a lot of times people will, may end up with refusals. And 
you know, judicial review has become a tool that a lot of people have to use to try and, uh, and, and get that human to finally look at the application and realize what the problem is. Because, you know, again, going back to what Josh said, we're not there yet in terms of all of the tech working well together. So the government's using it in different sort of separate ways. And when the when things fall through the cracks and they don't work out, which is unfortunately more and more often, um, there just isn't anyone who's assigned to review that issue and solve that problem. So we've had to take files to judicial review where um, applicants submitted documents where uh, uh, they were requested to do so, but the decision was rendered and they said, we never received your documents. But it clearly shows, for example, that they were uploaded in their portal, um, uh, situations where the applications submitted were not properly classified. Um, so there's all kinds of issues there. And then because the tools that are the AI decision making like Chinook also are not fully there yet in terms of making good decisions. You know, if your applicant is denied, then talking to them about judicial review, because the algorithm, if you try reapplication, it's a different ball game because the recent refusal will weigh heavily in that analysis mm -hmm. that the algorithm is going to do, leading likely to another refusal. So we see people who've had three, four, five refusals come to us and you know, we, 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 we come up with strategy and it's at that point that someone who's essentially a Department of Justice will review the file and that's when we can break that cycle that is the algorithm repeating exactly. um, the incorrect decision. Yeah. Thank you very much, Zainab. Uh, a lot of information from the government, definitely huge challenges, uh, pros, cons. Um, so I want to, to now go to Josh so that we can see also what opportunities are there uh, for immigration professionals. So you mentioned client communication, marketing, um, chatbots, uh, uh, preparing client documents, eligibility. Uh, so let's, let's dive into that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's super helpful from Zainab knowing kind of what we're up against and, and what's, you know, unfortunately, and a lot of times out of our control. Um, I'm lucky because I get to work on the stuff that, that is our, in our control and, and, you know, that we can kind of use to our benefit. Um, if it's okay, I'll share my screen quickly just yeah. to take everybody through a couple, what I think could be uh, pretty simple applications. And I'm just going to share my screen now. Does this, uh, can you, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. So just running through, and this is really quick, but we'll keep it more introductory, is a couple quick applications of, of AI that I've either used myself. I'm actually going to take you through a couple previous, you know, chat GPT prompts that I've actually used, as well as some that I've heard from clients. So I, I mentioned this quickly before right, is email responses, right? Could be email, could be for anything, right? LinkedIn, or maybe you have to write a letter or something like this, right? Something that most of us immigration professionals have to deal with a lot, right? What's happening with my application, right? And maybe you haven't had a decision yet. It's the end of a long day. You want to get something out. You don't want your present day frustration to pour into your email to your client. You also want it to sound professional, blah, blah, blah. Right now, I think the key to using chat GPT is learning how to use prompts, right? The better you get at using prompts, the better the output will be, right? You improve the input, the output will be better. The other thing that I think people should get really good at is the follow up suggestions, right? So, for example, here, I wanted a simple email, you know, responding to a client about their immigration application. I have not received a decision for you yet. Please make it two paragraphs or less we get an instant response from ChatGPT. But in my opinion, this is still too long, right? That's a lot of words to just say, I don't have an update. So I asked if they could please shorten it a bit and it gets shortened a bit, right? Play around with it. Remember that it's a, it can be an ongoing conversation, right? So another example of this is um, blog posts, right? I, I talked about digital marketing. Um, I used this this week, right? 
So I wanted a blog post about three steps to starting an immigration law practice in Canada, less than a thousand words, have an introduction, three key sections. And I told them what those sections should be and then a short conclusion, right? And it spit something out instantly, which is, you know, still kind of magic in, in my opinion. And then you do a quick review. And I said, you know what, can you write it in a more casual tone and also make it SEO friendly and optimized for the following term, right? And then it, again, it's, I mean, it's crazy, right? I'm on the free version, right? The fact that you can get this for free <laughs> exactly. within two minutes, right? This took me two minutes. And then I still thought it was a little bit too, like it, it was making fun of Canadians a little bit too much. So I, I, what I did was I took this, I copy pasted it onto our website and then I still went through it line by line and touched it up a little bit, right? But from start to finish, from like opening up chat GPT to like posting the blog on our website, probably 15 minutes, right? So that's another use. Another Versus thing what, is, 45, Josh, maybe that you would usually take 45 to an hour? Yeah, yeah, because usually if I'm writing it from scratch, I mean, you got to do a lot more ideating on what to actually write. And then you get the first draft done. And then I like to turn the computer off or switch tasks and then come back to it later and do an yeah. edit, right? So that it's not too fresh in your brain. This is another question that I asked. I don't remember probably within the last few weeks. I'm currently posting on LinkedIn five times per week and creating a video podcast one time per week. Can you create a social media content repurposing strategy so I can make the most of that content content and also suggest some good tools? Like ask it anything, right? So it's, it's giving me step-by-step step what to do with each of the piece of content that I'm already creating. And then at the bottom, a list of tools that I can use to do it. Right. Again, I still think marketing is the mo the biggest opportunity right now. Um, so things like creating blog posts, just creating plans to then create blog posts. Right. Can be really good. Um, there's a ton. Pretty much every tool out there now either has built in AI or you can find an AI tool. Right. AI tool for writing blog posts, AI tool for repurposing my videos into blog posts, AI tool for, you know, insert insert task here, right? And, and it's going to exist. So those are some of the big ones, right? Client communication, blog posting, strategy. Um, I'll quickly show you how Visto uses AI, um, where basically we do all the prompts for you, right? So really quickly, this is the Visto platform. We help you, you know, prep and manage and fill out entire applications for clients. And the beautiful thing when you do it all in one place is now we have your client information. So with Visto, you don't even type anything. You click a button and based on the type of application and information about your client, this happens in about five seconds by clicking two buttons. We create a cover letter, pulling in your logo and letterhead and then writing a submission letter, right? Based on the type of application, the client name, a little bit of a background of the client, what they're applying for and why. We pull any of their immediate family members being included in the application and what their relationship is. We pull a full list of supporting documents because we helped you prepare them so we know exactly what they are. And then we have a sign off with your name and information at the bottom, right? So this is by clicking two buttons, right? There's Our users don't have to type a single word. We have the same thing for a study plan right now. So again, you're working with an international student from outside Canada. My experiences working with students was you would send them a template, they'd ask you 100 questions, they would hem and haw, and two weeks later, they might send you a study plan that you, for the most part, have to rewrite. Um, with Visto, again, you come in, you click two buttons, there's no typing. And we can, with the right information from your client, name, school they're studying at, province, degree, um, we can prompt AI to draft a study plan that answers the key questions that we know IRCC wants answers to, pulls their education history, and then can of course be edited by both sides, right? So the student and the law firm. Um, I will note that in Visto, we always have clear warnings for anything AI generated, right? Um, we talked about this earlier, and I think that might be like an underlying theme, which is AI is really good, but you should not use AI to generate something and blindly submit it to IRCC, 
right? Just how I still think you shouldn't use AI to generate a blog post and blindly stick it on your website, right? AI for right now is incredible at getting you from zero to like 80 or zero to 90. But then part of what will separate you from the rest as well is that extra 10, 20% of you coming in, you doing an edit, you touching it up, you adding a little personalization to it. And um, that's what kind of like pushes it over the edge. So you still get the incredible outcome in half the amount of time. Eligibility, I'll just really, eligibility and chatbots, I'll kind of touch on quickly as well. Chatbots, I think, are in that category of not good enough yet, right? And we've been talking about this a lot because we know there will come a time where we will build a chatbot into Visto as well, but we don't think this tech's good enough yet, right? For us to turn a chatbot over to our users who trust us to answer questions from their clients, that's got to be really good which means if the client asks, hey, what's my eligibility requirements? We're giving them the eligibility requirements for their specific program and their specific profile, right? Because the eligibility requirements for a 23-year-old male applying through Express Entry is very different from a 27-year-old female with a spouse and a kid and applying for a study permit, right? So the AI has to have all that really good logic and interpretation built in so that we're always sharing correct information. On eligibility, I still think automation is better than AI because with eligibility, it's a little bit more objective, right? Do you have this many years of work experience? Do you have, you know, a Canadian degree, right? Express Entry is a great example, right? You don't really need AI to help you with Express Entry eligibility. We've already done that with automation, right? We've built tools where you can fill out a profile and it's a, an algorithm right? It's just logic coded on the back end that says, if this, then that, if this, then that, if this, then that, okay, that's their score. Okay. This is what they could do. Okay. This is how they can raise their score. You know what I mean? All that kind of stuff. So I, th I think again, on the eligibility side, we need a little bit more time and more iteration so that we can train AI, but certain elements of eligibility, you can fully accomplish right now with today's technology, just using automation and not AI. So that maybe I'll finish on that point, which is there are still some things you don't need AI for, and you can use other technology like automation and, you know, machine learning, you know, whatever that can do the stuff just as well. Don't just throw AI at everything because it's the new flashy, cool tool, right? There are incredible applications, but you don't have to use it for everything is how I'll finish there. Josh, and uh, regarding the, um the chatbots, you say that they're not there yet, but uh, how are our practices using it for? A chat, I'm not really seeing, what I'm using, what I'm seeing chatbots for right now are mostly marketing. So they'll stick okay. a chatbot on your marketing website and it's mostly for like client intake and evaluation, right? Hey, what can we help you with today? And you can click I want to study in Canada. I want to this in Canada. You know, I want to buy a business in Canada. Okay, great. Um, what is your timeline? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, enter your name and email and we'll get back to you, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably the best use on the chatbot side for right now is more on the mm -hmm. marketing, lead management, client <clears throat> conversion, maybe basic client support. Exactly. But I haven't, and again, this is something we're like discussing internally right now is like, do we even think it's worth the effort yet? The technology exists, but no one's gone out and trained a chatbot to be really good with immigration advice. It okay. will happen. It's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of how soon and who does it. We're trying to, what we're weighing, like our company Visto is weighing is, is it worth our time to do that right now? Or can we save our clients more time with other things? How can we use AI to, for example, you know, create custom invitation letters or to evaluate client files for you, right? Okay, your client uploaded all their documents. Can AI review all of that for you and say, hey, you know, immigration firm, this client's work experience is a little bit weak. This client's proof of funds is a little bit weak. You should check that out and, you know, this, this per person's reference letter does not match the specific requirements outlined under Express Entry, right? Okay. So all of this will come, 
It's just a matter of how and when. Um, the chat bot, I would also just be careful with, right? It's, it's got to be trained really well. It's got to be tested really hard um, before I would put it in front of our users or your clients. Exactly. So I think uh, everything related to AI we know has a, a huge disclaimer overall, right? I think we all agree on that. Um, I actually did a, a little poll with uh, our attendees and I asked them, are you currently using AI for anything in your practice? So we have 47% no, 45% uh, yes, and 8% saying that they will start today. <laughs> so basically, um, like going in line to what Josh was saying, start using it for marketing, download ChatGPT to play around with it, um, talk to Josh about Visto to see how he can help as well, and, and just get started. I mean, take maybe the, the fear away from it. It's not only uh, something that can work against you, but of course it can help you. It's going to bring huge benefits as well. And, so, and I'll just say, Mary, now, they, can, they can reach out to me. It doesn't have to be about Visto, right? I mean, that's right. kind of, you know, my passion is, is, is where immigration and AI overlap. But I'm using AI tools. So every two weeks I go live on LinkedIn and I talk about Canadian immigration. We were talking about that before the show. I use an AI tool called Video. I'm no association with it whatsoever, V-I-D-Y-O. I copy paste a YouTube link when the video is done and it generates snippets of short form content that I can then edit and post on TikTok. Like it's, it's totally nuts. If you're not leveraging some of these tools to create content, I think it's just a huge missed opportunity. Again, it depends on the firm. Maybe you have enough clients. Maybe you don't want to grow anymore, whatever, right? But if you're looking to grow your practice or build a brand of any kind, these tools are so powerful. It, it's incredible. And if you're not making use of them, I, I highly, highly recommend it. Josh, and do you want to name a few that you're using so people can, can look into them? Uh, this one, and are there any others that you would recommend? Yeah, so on, on the video side, I've tried a bunch. Video is good. Another good option for, for chopping up long form video is called Opus, O P U S. I think it's opus.pro or opus.clips or something like that. Um, I've used a tool called um, Pictory. Pictory allows you to take, so you just use ChatGPT to create a blog post. Now you can copy that blog post paste it and it will generate a short form video with images and an AI voice that reads it out for you on screen. So now you can take your blog post and create a video and never even record anything. You don't have to use your face. Like for those who are shy to put themselves out there and <laughs> record video and stuff like that, which I totally get. I mean, here's your solution, right? You could exactly. use a tool like 11 labs to generate really good quality uh, text to voice, right? So again, maybe you really like writing, you write a blog post, you take the text, you stick it in 11 labs, it generates a voice either with AI or you can upload recordings of your own voice and it will build an AI voice that can read stuff for you. Like it, it's totally oh, nuts, amazing. right? The, the ability is mostly <laughs> on, on the marketing side for right now. A few more will probably come to my head. I'll put them in the chat. But okay. I mean, th those right there should, should get you started. Um, yeah. Repurpose, dot, I think, dot .io allows you to like then take one of those pieces of content, upload it, and it'll help you like repurpose it into a hundred different types of content that you can share on all the different platforms. So the tools are endless. The hardest part with evaluating tools right now is because of the AI hype and all the venture mm -hmm. capital being thrown at it is there's so many of them. So you have to kind of try a bunch, evaluate them and see which ones are good and see which ones are, are not so good. Amazing. So, so just a note, I mean, uh, everybody needs to get started. The tools are out there. Uh, some of them are free, some of them are paid, but you need to be up to date to what's happening and see how it can help uh, you uh, become more efficient, become better and provide a better service, right? Um, let me go to Sainab. Uh, Sainab, um, going back to, to the government and, and AI in general, what are some of the predictions 
for the future? What do you think is going to happen? When? Uh, what should we see more uh, in AI with with government uh, like decisions and and everything that that you master? <laughs> um. I wish I had a real crystal ball, but I have some predictions, so I can kind of talk about that. I think, you know, we'll look back in three to five years and the way in which we interact with IRCC and submit applications will be completely different to anything that we've done in the past. Um, it might be a little bit slower than that just because we're dealing with the government, but I think the tools will be there that, you know, a lot of the repeat um, work that we do is, for example, someone has done an initial application, then future applications, we have to keep submitting the same information. I think the tools on the government side will become more advanced where based on your profile or UCI number, that information might be pre-populated into their applications and you, you know, a lot of that friction will go away. Um, I think I think that's a big part of it. Uh, I hope there will be more disclosure on the part of IRCC when they're using, um, you know, AI tools, but their AI tools will become more um, advanced. So I was listening to Josh, for example, talking about the way in which we put together submissions and we can use AI. And I think it will either become a situation where it's AI versus AI, or it's the government's AI calling out our use of AI. And so we'll have to stay like use AI plus our brain, like that will be the added value of what we have. Um, so I, I see that in the future. And then, you know, because again, I work on the litigation side and I deal with refusals. There's a lot of interesting things that are going, I think are going to happen on that side in terms of, you know, we already know there was a, it was a very famous case earlier this year where a lawyer tried to use chat GPT to, to create um, court filings. And, ChatGPT hallucinated case law that it cited in there and it had citations and it had quotes from them and those cases just simply didn't exist. And so I think in as we go into the future and I think those tools are uh, perhaps trained on actual litigation data, then we're going to see developments there. But um, I think we're also going to see, you know, this is being used in other jurisdictions. I think Brazil is one of them where the courts are adopting AI in terms of their writing of decisions or analysis of applications. So overall, there's going to be um, wider scale adoption of AI, I think, across the board. And we can use, you know, one of the tools that IRCC and Department of Justice really are developing is um, litigation analytics, which kind of goes back to what Josh was saying about eligibility. If there, you know, if a file has been refused, can we look at it and use AI tools to do a prediction of how likely is this going to be to have a successful outcome in federal court? So there's a lot of different aspects of this conversation. Um, and I think the, the, the participants of this session are way ahead of everybody else. And the idea that, um, you know, going to, um, I think what I would like to leave everyone with, I think I'll, I'll say it this way is, these conversations need to continue to happen. And if you are part of the conversations, you can identify these issues as they come up, as opposed to not knowing the ways in which your applications, your clients' applications, and you know, uh, a lot of these tools are gonna expand outside of immigration context too, are gonna be used. And if you know, then you're better prepared to be able to seek out solutions. Um, you know, when the government's using a lot more AI and on the intake side, then you'll be able to understand how you can use certain tools on on preparation side as well. Um, and one point I want to make, Marinella, which is with respect to um, business applications specifically, mm -hmm. and maybe you got you can also talk about how Journey, um, you know, is approaching this. But my experience with business applications is they do require a lot of explanation. And yes, there is a business plan, but there's a lot of walking the officer through, you know, what it is they want to do, how it is that they're going to do it, what their, you know, background is and so on. And 
there might be a lot of opportunity to, to use things like chat GPT or AI to sort of generate some of that. But I, I would say there's definitely a word of caution because if we increasingly use those, the tools that are used by the government can pick up on them as well. And just as we call out IRCC for using template refusals, I, I have seen this happen where they've called out, um, they've detected similar language being used in applications and that flags an application in terms of, um, you know, have, needing additional analysis. So just another point to keep in mind. Thank you, Saina, definitely. And, and I was about to mention a little bit of, of our stance as Journey, uh, because we do get the question from some clients, are you using AI? Uh, are you going to use AI for my business plan? So uh, it's a little bit like lawyers for us. Uh, currently, Journey does not employ AI in the preparation of any of our business plans. And the reason why we've made this decision is because what we do now is a fusion of business, entrepreneurial, and immigration strategies from our partners, which require the human touch, the human element to, to make sure that it's meticulous, it's precise, it's tailor-made, um, which characterizes our deliverables. And of course, um, ethical and confidentiality concerns are huge. Um, and these, of course, are limiting how we apply AI currently. Uh, however, it doesn't mean that we won't in the future in different ways. Um, we may be able to use it for research and other, and other things. Uh, so I, I like to say, like much like a typewriter in its era and the Internet, when we started using it for research and subscriptions. So we do anticipate that AI would evolve to a point where it becomes more precise and some of the content can be reliably uh, vetted and trusted. Um, so it perhaps, uh, I mean, we don't know when, but perhaps it eventually will be able to create an, an ugly first draft, as I, as I say, to expedite the process. Uh, when that time arrives, of course, we are confident that um, we are going to be prepared. Uh, we have a technology team and, and we're going to we're going to make sure that if we do use it, uh, that we're going to leverage its potential for the benefit of the, of the industry as a whole. Um, so like I said, currently uh, our stance on AI is that we still consider it highly risky, uh, but we are exploring its potential in different areas as well as just, uh, Josh was mentioning, sales, marketing, and overall as the team's uh, efficiency without, of course, compromising the quality of our work. Uh, but thank you, Sainab, for, for mentioning that. Um, I wanted to go into the Q&A. We have very good questions. I know we, we are going a little bit beyond as usual, uh, but it's because we get excited with all these topics, right? <laughs> so let me go ahead with the questions. For those who need to leave, we understand. But for those who need to stay, uh, we're, we're grateful for that as well. So let's jump into the questions. Uh, we have a question from Phil Mooney. Um, can we use AI to find case precedents? For example, um, all FC decisions on TRV refusals. I, I, I don't think you need AI necessarily to find that at this point. Um, we're not there yet, and unless you use maybe some of the paid versions of ChatGPT for, uh, you know, if, if you were if you found all the cases from the last five years of TRV refusals, if you wanted to get summaries of them, maybe you could use a, a paid version to sort of feed in all of those cases and get summaries. Um, but uh, we're not there yet in terms of the uh, AI tools that have been developed for accessing and analyzing federal case law yet. No, not yet. But I, I think that's one of the things that's coming. I, I, I did speak to someone who claimed that he is using it, but just as like a very tertiary, you know, initial search, I should maybe circle back with him and ask exactly how he was using it. I don't remember if it was chat GPT or, or, or what it was, but yeah, I, I think at the very least you should take all of it with a grain of salt and, and, and use it as a, as a starting point. And, and at least with all the uh, federal court decisions, they're available publicly, so you can verify every single, you know, case and citation. Um, I think it's a little bit more difficult if you get into litigation more broadly and being able to find those precedents. But 
within the, fe uh, the immigration and federal court context, that is possible. And remember, ChatGPT, at least in its current variation, is sort of locked in as of, I think, 2021, the data that it has access to it. So it wouldn't even have access to the latest uh, uh, federal court decisions or anything like that. That's a, a very interesting point. So, so a lot of what's happening on AI, um, it depends on what you feed it, right? So a lot of people are creating their own versions of their chat GPT, right? And, and we've seen, because we do business plans on the US side, and this has also uh, been a conversation, uh, we do see people that are developing uh, current, their own chat GPTs by feeding it with uh, vetted legal information and that includes cases includes um also laws and and everything regarding the the legal realm so that they can really trust what they are receiving when they ask uh the the chat the legal chat gpt one thing i will just add in here and i think you know it kind of goes back to developing of ai technology and this is a big conversation is where is that data coming from and privacy around the use of that data. I think that I'm just putting this out there. And if someone's thinking about this, um, you know, making sure that permissions were there in terms of being able to obtain that data, what it was going to be used for, because essentially your 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 AI needs large volumes of, of data to be able to do that. One of the challenges, for example, on, on being able to build some of these litigation analytics tools is um, the, the terms and conditions of the various tools that report these decisions don't necessarily allow us to essentially scrape them all and, 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 and download them en masse. Um, and if you're using other kinds of data, you have to make sure that you have the right permissions, privacy, because if you build a tool and um, there's all kinds of issues with, with data, but if it was based on data that you didn't have permission to use, there could be liability there. Um, there's, there's questions about the quality and bias, um, but I would leave all of that to data scientists to be able to talk about. Great. Um, this is a question for Josh. Um, so gener generative AI, um, is being used for templated submission letters uh, for business cases. Uh, so will IRCC be able to tell? Will they then be in doubt of the credibility if somebody has used this? Uh, and this can be for both, actually, Saina or, or Josh. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this goes. This this comes to one of the themes of this presentation, right? Which is use AI to get to step eight or nine, and then infuse personal input into it. Right. So, for example, and, and, and I mean, two examples. Number one is what did what do people do without AI? They use a template. Right. If you're going to do a study permit application and you do a lot of study permit applications, you probably have a submission letter template. Right. Or you copy paste the client's name and blah, blah, blah. And you touch up. OK, what are their home ties? And you, you, you know what I mean? But your intro, your conclusion, some of the stuff in the middle might be the exact same. Right. I know for me, especially on the corporate side, when I would file LMIAs and work permits that were like pretty standard. Eighty five percent of the submission letters were word for word, the exact same. Right. So, number one, we've kind of already been doing it in the past. Right. Maybe a little bit different for things like study plans or JRs when you're like writing up a document, like an argument kind of from scratch. But I would say, number one, people have already been using templates for decades. Right. So keep that in mind. And number two is, again, please use AI to get to like 80, 90 percent, but then touch it up. So, for example, on Visto, we've had clients generate maybe hundreds of cover letters, maybe more. I don't know. I don't have the number off the top of my head, but cover letters and study plans. And what they do is they generate it as a starting point. Then their team and or their client will review any document that we generate with AI on Visto can always be edited. And in fact, it's we should probably make it required. But like we have a warning, like, please edit this document. Right. Do not post it as is. So for example, for the study plan, what I always recommend is this, generate the study plan. You have your first draft in five seconds. Now tell your student to spend 10, 20 minutes instead of maybe two, three hours writing a plan from scratch, 
spend 20 minutes, go line by line, maybe even rewrite a few sentences, add in a few personal touches that the AI didn't cover, and then you're done. Then it goes to the legal team. Now the legal team should do a review. Maybe you rewrite a few sentences, make sure what the student added in makes sense, right? So in effect, it's like the same thing as using a template, but it takes a 10th of the time, right? So if you're strategic about it, like we launched our AI in February and I have not had a single complaint from a client saying, hey, I, I submitted a document using Visto's AI and it got refused because they, you know, for whatever reason, right? Related to the, the AI, right? So that's what I think the one major take, one of the couple major takeaways would be use it as a starting point, use it intentionally and still infuse your personal experience and knowledge and you should be totally fine if you do that properly. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Zaina, we have a question for you. Uh, what would be the implication of using AI such as ChatGPT on our code uh, of professional responsibilities? What is your guidance about compliance rules and ethical considerations to be aware of, including what needs to be disclosed to the clients when using AI? It's a question from Alie Sabetra. Hi, Alie. Um, I think that's a great question. I don't know necessarily specifically because I think the code of conduct is for um, the College of Immigration Consultants, but I think the idea is in terms of the response I'm going to give carry over whether you're a consultant or a lawyer. And it's, you know, to do with providing the best service to your client and keeping them informed. So I, I would, if we are using any uh, kind of tools, provide explanations to them of what they are and how they're being used. So, if, you know, with Josh's, it would be an explanation of the study plan um, is being, a, a first draft is being generated with this, right? Um, and one of the key things in any application is always to get sign off of the client on the application and the application forms before submission. So I think that's a huge part of this. Um, one thing I think people have to be very careful of when using ChatGPT specifically is that it's a it's a public tool. So I haven't tried using the pub, the private one, the the paid one, whether your data becomes private or not. And I'm not sure how the wraparound tools work. But if you go into the normal ChatGPT and you put in information, that becomes a part of their you know data set, and you have to be extremely careful not to include client information, client details. So you could perhaps ask it to draft an email, but don't include the client's name, don't include uh, biometric information or file numbers or anything that would identify the client. Um, so there's, there's privacy concerns there. And I think, um, you know, just generally uh, keeping them informed. And finally, this, this kind of is an overarching theme in terms of, these are all tech tools that we're using. I think everyone should be very mindful of, um, you know, cybersecurity and making sure that the tools you're using, your data, your documents, your information, your clients' documents are protected. Um, and, you know, I think that falls under that ethical part that we would be, that would fall under the code of conduct. And that as lawyers, we have to also be mindful of. Thank you, Zainab. We have another question. I believe we touched a little bit on this, but but I'll repeat it here. Uh, Gagandeep Singh asks, uh, how do we deal with the biases in the tool? For example, filing an application for a client who already has a previous rejection, will AI lean towards rejecting it again? Uh, so I believe you spoke about the option of judici judicial review, correct? Um, so yes, so, so the idea is not, don't let like the repetitive refiling happen, go to judicial review, uh, instead. And, and then there's another question related to that, which is, um, if there's a decision of rejection, uh, will AI be the one reviewing, uh, the rejection or will it be human? Uh, reconsiderations. That's a very good question. I... <laughs> There's, there's no clear answer on this. What I can say is that if an application is refused, it goes to judicial review and it's successful and it's reopened. The internal guidelines from IRCC is that it does not go back into Chinook and it should be processed by a human decision maker, so an officer. And that's why the rates of acceptance after judicial review are extremely high. 
That's number one. Two, a reconsideration. Um, you know, it, it used to be that officers just had more time and they could actually review it. I know for a fact now that they don't. And that's why reconsiderations take a long time and they're highly unlikely to be successful just because of time constraints. It appears in um, a lot of the GCMS notes that I've seen that it is under human decision maker. That's at least how it's coded in the GCMS notes um, indicating the reconsideration response. Um, but typically it's another very standard language sort of template that says, we've looked at the evidence and we're refusing it again. Um, it doesn't appear to be um, tech focused at this point. And that's why it takes longer. Thank you, Zainab. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up. We'll, we're uh, 20 minutes above. So I wanna be respectful of everybody's time, but I appreciate uh, the more than 105 people who are still here. Uh, so uh, I wanted to ask you for a few closing remarks on the topic, and then we'll we'll end the, the webinar. Uh, you can go ahead, Josh. Yeah, thank you, Marianella. Thank you, Journey. Thank you, Zena, for joining um, because she knows that side better better than anybody. Um, yeah, I, I would say keep everything Zainab has in mind and by all means adjust accordingly. And then on the more proactive side, start using it even in small handfuls if you can, right? Use it for very basic things. If you want to get into more digital marketing or content creation and you don't know how, ask, G ask ChatGPT. Hey, I'm an immigration professional. I have a small firm in the town of blah, blah, blah. What do you recommend as like two or three things that I could ease into for content creation? And then when it tells you what to do, ask it to do it for you. Oh, it's okay. You should blog once a week. Okay. Can you please give me some topics? Okay. Can you please write a blog about topic number two? Right. So start playing around with it. It'll really start opening your mind as well. Right. Just going through that activity. So anyways, get started. If you have any questions, like I, I'm, I'm living and breathing this, right. Like I said, on the operation side with Visto, if you're interested in improving your operations, preparing and submitting applications and giving your clients the benefit of a good experience with technology and AI, then check us out. Our website is visto.ai. If you want to just get in touch with me about immigration, AI, operations, content marketing, um, by all means, get in touch. I think they've posted our contact info. I'm pretty good with email. I'm also pretty good with LinkedIn. Definitely connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm posting very often, especially about these types of topics. So I'm happy in whatever way to have conversations about this stuff. Hopefully we'll, we will have more in the future. We were talking, you know, Zainab and Marianella and, and the team about how, you know, this is going to be a, an evolving and important topic in our industry. So hopefully we can keep it going as things evolve in the future and appreciate everyone taking time out of their busy day on Wednesday uh, to tune in. And lastly, if, if you have any uh, visto.ai, uh, not IO, um, if you have any feedback, by all means, right? Maybe that'll be built in through Journey or through the platform. I don't know, but always open to feedback on whether you enjoyed it, it was helpful exactly. or not, et cetera. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Josh. Dana, let's hear a few sure. closing remarks from you. Um, it, yeah, for me, it's always fascinating talking on this topic. And uh, I think just maybe by the way that we broke down the conversation points today, it might sound like I'm, I'm more of a pessimist on the future and the use of AI, but I, I want to make it clear that I'm not a Luddite and I actually think that the adoption of technology can be um, great. I, I, I use it in my own practice. I encourage my, uh, my team and my clients to also use it. I think um, once we know about the risks that we work around that, or we know in which the, you know, the ways in which the government's using it, it can assist us in preparing our applications. Um, but I, I'm also, you know, very much uh, open to that future that we're going to have where hopefully, you know, uh, a lot of the, um, the issues that we're even talking about today are going to disappear because technology will have solved them. Um, the way in which information can be shared more easily and kept and, and edited if it needs to be. So I want to leave on that positive note that I think this is 
a fascinating area to be active in and, and, and definitely to keep tabs on because it's extremely important for all of our practices. Um, I'm not as active on LinkedIn as Josh, but I also do post on there. So um, you can follow me there to, to learn about developments regarding um, particularly the use of AI on the government decision making side of things. Thanks. Thank you, Zainab. So yes, definitely AI elevating uh, this and many other industries uh, to maybe save some time, make us more efficient, have us be focused more on, on the real human elements that we should be focusing on. So see it as an opportunity, take the fear away from it, uh, use it, use it carefully, play around with it, and definitely be up to date with, with everything that's happening with AI in all industry, but specifically also in immigration and related to us, business immigration, of course. So thank you so much, St. Evan, Josh. Uh, I mean, great guests. Um, so, I mean, at Journey, we're so grateful to, to have you accept our invitation and be able to share your wonderful knowledge. So thank you very much. Until next time. Hopefully it will be soon. Right, Josh and Zainab? Any, yeah. any time <laughs> for you, Marianella, any time. You just let me know the day and the time. Thank you, Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Thank Josh. you. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.